tools are not necessarily the best solution for human problems, you know, and often one of the reasons why people get really pissed off with technology is because they forget that what the technology is doing is connecting humans to humans, and the humans are very happy to scapegoat a technology when, in fact, they don't really want to have the conversation amongst themselves. We want to avert any kind of discomfort as human beings. You're listening to Unintended Consequences, the podcast that explores how systems become large and complex and how they change the lives of everyone they touch. I'm Kim Harrison, team sociologist. I'm Yoz Graham, software wrangler. And I'm Heidi Waterhouse, transformation advocate. We work at LaunchDarkly, the feature management platform that gives you more control over your code and how it gets delivered. Unintended Consequences is brought to you by HeavyBit, an accelerator and venture fund dedicated to helping startups take their developer products to market. For more information, visit heavybit.com. This episode is the second half of our conversation with Dr. Alex Krutowski. It's about ethics, accountability, and the standard metric tomato. This is a great kind of segue to, like, the ethics of the thing. I mean, some people are thinking about the ethics of it. Some people are not, not because they don't care, but because, like you said, it's usually just people who have to get a thing out because there's a meeting that's going to happen in a day or an hour. There's unintended consequences. You build a thing and don't realize, holy crap, there's something I should have considered. How do you think about the ethics of the thing without slowing yourself down? Or do you need to accept that you have to slow yourself down and be considerate of that because these systems are now so freaking huge? Well, it goes back to being humble. Mm -hmm. and even recognizing that you have to think about the ethics. I think that's so important. And I think also being really explicit about how you conceptualize humans and human behavior. Really, really explicit. I think human beings do this. This is why I put this in like this. Mm -hmm. Discuss. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't work for you, let's have a conversation. I am not going to answer every single person's question. I'm not going to solve for every single person's problem. This is how I think of people. I think that's, first of all, the most important thing. You know, I do still think that there's a responsibility on people to be a little bit critical of what it is that they're using rather than just thinking, ooh, here's a thing, I'm just going to eat it. You know, digital citizenship and all of that, media literacy, digital literacy is, is a really important thing. But I think that, you know, first of all, being humble, secondly, being really, really explicit in your sort of reflexivity moment, in your reflexivity problem is a good way of being. And define recognize when things are getting so big that you need to start being more humble. <laughs> so, you know, the classic example is do no evil. But what does evil actually mean <laughs> in this context, right? And how do you define evil and how do you define what you're doing? And now that you've gone beyond the moment when you can control for that, because so many people are using your technology or whatever. How can you be less evil? <laughs> you be less evil and be very clear about the fact that you're being less evil. I think that those are some of the ways of being more ethical. It also depends, Kim, I think, on what you're thinking of, what you mean when you talk about ethic. I mean, um, I know that governments are now thinking about this and getting involved. They're saying this is a standard set of rules and behaviors to be compliant within. And we expect you to uphold that. Don't have a data leak and share everybody's credit card information. Yeah, but I mean, that's hard. That's really hard because you're always going to get actors on the outside who are going to try and get into a closed system, mm -hmm. aren't you? We now have a situation, and I think that this is something that the pandemic has done, where governments are not only being asked this more specifically. This was like, I think, something in the UK about a new set of guidelines around children and privacy and how children's data is is handled online and especially because now that children's daily lives are happening almost entirely through the computer in terms of education and so much socialization is happening through the computer because you know so little of in-person uh, interaction is happening right now this is when suddenly all these tools pop up like proctorio and and other things which are basically saying oh yeah all kids are going to cheat the whole time so we need to be watching them and analyzing their every movement and then reporting on anything that looks like cheating and so knocking a huge percentage of them out of school or out of their degrees because of something that our AI thinks is cheating or suspicious. But 
is there a way, is there a framework for making these kind of ethical decisions or guidelines in a hurry? Because that's what we've had to do this year. No. <laughs> right. Because ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to create solutions for questions that we don't actually know the answers of, <laughs> aren't we? Before we even have those questions. So there are a lot of ethical guidelines already out there. Mm -hmm. I've helped to contribute to many of them. Most of them are within the academe, within the ivory tower. Those are good places to start because often they're guidelines rather than regulations. You know, they pose questions more often than they actually provide the answers. You know, is this really what you want to do? Recognizing that tools are not necessarily the best solution, right? That's a, that's a big thing. Tools are not necessarily the best solution for human problems, you know, and often one of the reasons why people get really pissed off with technology is because they forget that what the technology is doing is connecting humans to humans, and the humans are very happy to scapegoat a technology when, in fact, they don't really want to have the conversation amongst themselves. So, I mean, that's it's something I talk a lot about because, you know, we want to avert any kind of discomfort, don't we, as human beings? So I realize in posing that question, I am doing exactly the kind of thoughtlessness and short-termist thinking that is the problem here. Well, yeah, exactly. This is a short-term issue. It's, it, uh, we hope. What is good is when things come along that break our boundaries, Mm. So that we can then have those conversations, as long as people do not come to harm, right? What people are afraid of is that the Overton window pushes the acceptability of, for example, you know, an AI making a decision about whether something is plagiarism or, you know, a technology just simply constantly tracking you. Think about would you want that to happen to your mom? Would you want that to happen to your kids? Would you want that to happen to you? How would you feel about that? Then, of course, we have other issues of psychology, which is like, oh, well, I'd be fine with it. I've got nothing to, to hide, whatever. You know, then we, then we get into politics and then you get into a whole different thing, which is why coming up with an ethical guideline is very, very difficult to do because there are many, many different opinions in this world. So how to come up with an ethical approach... Perhaps it's not about solutions-based thinking. Mm -hmm. Being flexible is key and understanding that we all come from different reference points. We all have different perspectives and being open to that. That's right. Get rid of the hubris. Stop thinking that you have the solution, that you're able to do it. Don't think that. You've looked at, what, five academic articles and you've, you've played around with a couple of online quizzes and therefore you know how human beings are. I know that's incredibly rude and I'm going to get completely flamed for that. And I recognize that that's not how these things work. But you know what I mean? Like, it's magic. It's magic what's happening. And we got to figure out what's inside that black box. Otherwise, we will end up with mad ethical breaches. Right. And I found myself questioning something you were saying earlier about that humans aren't that simple, that we don't have, you know, these very simple switches that you can hit, which is mostly true. Exactly. It's mostly true. <laughs> but then there are the times when it isn't. Right. I'm uh, thinking of like Bay Area company Zynga or King, which is a British company, right, which have made literally billions off the predictability of humans when it comes to game stimuli and gambling stimuli. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I think they've even had huge research departments internally looking at exactly that kind of thing. Absolutely. So it depends, right? It, <laughs> it depends. Ça dépend. You know, it totally depends on the situation and whether you want to well it's not evil it's just it's just what your desire is human beings are incredibly messy when you are trying to create for solutions that are trying to replicate or examine or operate on the back of something that is messy and human but then we also have our kind of twitch mechanisms Malcolm Gladwell writes a lot about these things. Mm. I have a lot of problems with Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to reduce the human, and he likes to reduce my field of research to very simple. Mm. And here's things. a load of stories, and then something to think exactly. about. Super, super, super well written. I mean, what an, uh, truly, what a fantastic writer. But again, he's telling stories. He's telling a particular story, and he's pulling in the the things that he wants to pull in. So anyway, so. 
one of the questions I wanted to ask for, for our podcast, for when we're talking, because here we're coming to you asking for advice for how we go and talk to these, especially we'll be talking to a lot of entrepreneurs, but but hopefully also people who aren't mainly in it for the money or aren't currently trying to build a business around this kind of thing. When we are talking to people with a vested interest, what are the best approaches for talking to them about it? When you're doing this kind of research, this is both for finding out the truth of what they think or for getting them to think in a more human way. Part of why we want to talk to you is we exist in a bubble. We live in Silicon Valley. And so we want your outsider's perspective to hold us accountable, to keep us honest and say, like, don't forget, there are other people that see this in a very different way than you do because you're so entrenched in it all the time. Oh, man, seriously. Funnily enough, going back to Second Life, I remember having the opportunity to join the company full time and... I had been in, you know, on a on a consultancy basis for the work that I was doing. But at the same time, I've been a journalist. At that time, I was a tech journalist, and I'm still a tech journalist, but I was more of a sort of a, a systems you know, products tech journalist. And I was told that I would have to stop doing that. And I remember thinking, I can't, because that's the only thing that's giving me the outside world. Because I know what would happen is that if I stopped doing the journalism and being required to have a really broad, (laughs) broad view of what was going on just for my job, I just wouldn't. It's so easy to just not do that. Mm -hmm. So what are the ways to get people to think about these things? Before getting into that, that how to get them to think, what are the best ways to approach these conversations, to what tones do you use? What kinds of questions do you ask? So just get them even to be honest, let alone get them to actually think. Okay. So if I was asking somebody about serendipity, for example, right, we'll just go back to that. And actually, I ended up doing the serendipity engine ended up being supported by Google. Um, wow. And I presented it. Yeah, I presented it at their at their big tent um, event and Zeitgeist as well. So they were very, very supportive of the research that I was doing that was kind of contradicting what it was that they were doing or not contradicting, but sort of inquiring about, you know, I think the first thing is, is to find out what it is, get the pitch, <laughs> find out what what the wow is that's going to get people to to put money into it, which usually has a we are solving for human problem X by doing Y. Right. Find out what they define human problem X as. What is human problem X? What is serendipity? What is it to you? What do you think it is? Okay. And, you know, what have you found about it? Okay. That's interesting. And who says that? And why do you think it is this? (laughs) Why do you think serendipity is something that you can program when, in fact, it's also to do with somebody's background and their ability to interpret the accident that's fallen in front of them as happy or sad. How are you going to make sure that you capture that moment and create that emotional response that is going to get these people ready and willing, your consumers ready and willing to respond to your solution to human problem X? as blah, blah, blah. Who is it that you think you're actually talking to? Not just like, this is my possible audience. Like, tell me, define for me, draw for me a picture of, tell me a story about this person and who they are. What happens when your your aunt, who's a technophobe, picks up this thing because suddenly that's the only way that they can communicate with you? What's she going to, how is she going to navigate that? Yeah, but she's, she can't see. She's, she's, she's blind. Oh, okay. Well, she's, she's also, you know, she's hard of hearing. And so how do we make sure that, you know, and just sort of start to pose different, start to be that really irritating person that everybody hates at a party, which is why I don't go to very many parties. (laughs) And the only reason my partner is still talking to me is because we are married and we eat dinner together. (laughs) And sometimes we talk about things that aren't this. And the reason why I still work, you know, I still make the radio programs that I make is because we don't script all the time. (laughs) And I don't keep asking them, why did you put this in here? And what exactly are you trying to say at this moment in time? Mm -hmm. But those are really fun questions because the thing is, right, the thing is, is that the people that you're going to be speaking with, Mm -hmm. they will have done a lot of work on this. Right? They will have done a lot of work to come up with a solution. They don't like to be questioned about it because it's hard. It's icky to be like have somebody be questioning 
about these things. But if you ask them in a way that shows that actually you're really bloody interested, you're like, no, I want to know about how this. I'm not trying to catch you out. I'm just trying to find out a little bit more about why you're talking about this and why you think this is a problem and how you think the reason that you, the way that you've come up with solving this problem is going to be the best way to solve it for this person. Well, what about for this person? That's what I love about talking with people. People may not like talking with me, but I'll tell you what, almost after every interview that I do, truly, and I, I'm so proud of this, almost after every interview that I do, I have people coming back to me. It's happened enough times that I know they're not blowing smoke up my ass. They say, I've never thought about this in this way. I've had such a lovely conversation. And all I'm doing is just asking him questions because I'm interested. And I think that's the best way to approach it is like, I'm not trying to catch you out. I'm genuinely, truly interested. That's great. It doesn't work when you're in a big party. It works when you're sitting down with somebody one to one. It works when you're at a, you know, you are at a dinner party and the, the two of you are sitting next to one another and you can just get lost in a conversation. It doesn't work in public. It works in private. I'm thinking of like the, I have a terrible memory. And yet one of the earliest party conversations I can truly re like re seriously remember because it shook me and made me reevaluate things, you know, in my early twenties, somebody asked, well, I'd taken it for granted in my life that I didn't seem to like travel very much. And somebody was almost offended and she was continually quizzing me about it. That <laughs> It made me look at it in a way that goes, ah, well, hang on, you know, and opened up things about myself. It's it's amazing. But it's especially because it's something that clearly that as an engineering exercise you have to do because you have to take a human thing and then find a way to represent it in ones and zeros, right? You have to break it down. The trouble that we see is that quite often they do this initial breakdown and then they don't question it again. Or they only question right, it exactly. when it comes to what extra database columns do we need? Yes. Absolutely. And the problem is, is that like when you start to when you start to ask these questions, it's like an onion. You start to peel it back and you peel it back or it's like a giant lotus flower, whatever, it, whatever it is. It just starts to kind of tree diagram and expand in all kinds of different directions. And at some point you do have to set boundaries. And I think that the way to do this is to say, I know you've had to set boundaries at some point. Mm -hmm. Why did you set them there? I really want to know why you set them there. Why does this feel good to you? You know, why don't you like travel? What is it about travel? Is it, you know, is it because you're on an airplane? Is it because you've got jet lag? Is it because you don't have the food that you like? Is it because you don't have your bed? Do you really like your pillow? Oh, I love my pillow. I love my pillow so much. I know people who actually take their pillows with them traveling. And, you know, yeah. like just those types of ways of just like really trying to understand what's driving somebody. Somebody's built this. They've spent hours, usually, you know, not at their day job. If it is at their day job, it started out as a nugget of something else. They've thrown their heart into it. Wow, it's amazing what you've done. It's amazing what you've done. How did you get there? And, you know, what happened when you hit your crisis of confidence? Mm -hmm. When you lost the moment, when you had a moment where you were like, what I'm doing is bullshit. Mm. What brought you back? What kept you going? Because those are the human things that you can get at. And by asking them about those things, then you leave it up to them to make the decision about whether they want to change it within their system or not. And that ties into as well, what like what are the driving forces? What are your markers for success here? And mm. what are specifically, what are the kinds of success or Absolutely. failure that aren't to do with money? Right? Oh, this is like values. Totally. What are your values? Yeah, totally. But that's what you get through talking with people. You know, when you when you really hear them, when you really just stop and say, you just sort of shine a light on what it is that, that is magical to them about what it is that they're doing. And then that opens up the most fantastic conversations because then you can start talking about values. In a way that's not direct, what are your values? Because if you say, what are your values to somebody? Then they're just going to, they're going to trot out whatever's in the press release. I value human beings and I value this. It, no, mm -hmm. it's through example. Oh, isn't that nice? You know, what does that mean? What is that? What, how do you, I just came off a conversation about monsters. I'm making a radio program. This is something I've wanted to do for a really long time. And we finally found a way in, in the series that I do. 
the idea behind it is what we talk about, what we really talk about when we're talking about monsters, right? We're not talking about a werewolf or a vampire or a zombie. We're talking about fears and anxieties. We're talking about things that are within us that we create a metaphor of that other people understand. And if you can get to that and then you can start breaking down what that metaphor means because what people are making, these beautiful creations that we're all using and thinking are magic, they're metaphors for what people think that human beings need. Right. Now I'm feeling very <sighs> optimistic again. <laughs> I'm I'm so feeling very small. It can't help it. It's in my nature to be a bit of an optimist. And it's I feel like it's so easy to look back and say, wow, they made a big mistake. They should have known. And sometimes, yeah, we should have. But sometimes we didn't. And sometimes it truly was a passion piece. And somebody felt like they had a wonderful thing to share. And it's a tool that's helpful or... I don't know, an app like Instagram that's just a fun way to share photos with your friends. And yeah, it could go sideways, but I don't know. For me, I feel like most of the time people have good intentions. I like to think that. I also think, though, that there are opportunities that we have to make decisions in our lives. And sometimes we go so far down one that we realize that there's no way of going back. I mean, that's what midlife crises are all about, aren't they? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, my God, I've gone this far, and now I can never go back and become an astronaut or whatever it is. And I think, you know, there are inflection points in our lives where we make decisions about what it is that we want to do, about projects that we want to take on. And sometimes our intentions are unethical, and we can correct for them if they're caught early, if we wish to. Or we could just keep going down that path and turn into a total annihilating, horrifying monster. But, you know, then that's the decision that we make. So, I don't know. There's also a piece in there about what are the big decisions that you've made. You know, Yaz, you just... you shared something with me that I didn't know about you, which is that I didn't know you don't like travel. And that that moment, like that conversation, ironically, given that where you are now, but, <laughs> but that conversation, you know, meant something. Why did that mean something to you? I want to like, I'm fast. I want to go down that, that rabbit hole and, and explore that to find out even more about yours. The thing is, I like travel now more than I did. But the, the thing that ultimately it opened up, which it, it that I'll just tell you because you'll see how it opened up a whole bunch of other stuff in my life. Realizing that I didn't like travel because I have a bad memory for experience. And so what happened was that I would come away from travel just mainly remembering all the hassle of, you know, all the hassle of travel, all the pain of getting packed up and, 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 and not remembering enough of the good times, enough of the unique experiences that make travel worthwhile. And so focusing more on those experiences and doing it in a way where I came away with not just memories, but artifacts and photographs and, and things like that made it much more enjoyable for me. What was it about that conversation that kind of stopped you in your tracks? What was the, she, she kept pestering you. Why don't you like travel? You don't like travel. Was that it? She was, you and you were like, shut up already. <laughs> well, it was, it was, it was the way that she seemed almost offended by it, which I can understand, right? Because I can see how if you really value the rest of the world and the, the viewpoint that traveling the world gives you and the exposure to other cultures gives you, then seeing somebody who is willfully refusing those experiences, it, it feels like an obnoxious kind of obstinacy. You know, it's like somebody saying, I refuse to be educated. I refuse to open my eyes. But it in doing so, you know, I the thing is, I was trying to answer her question every time. I wasn't just kind of stalling. And I was going into it and going, okay, well, this is what I don't like. This is what I don't like. Why don't I like these things? And then she was like, well, but what about these things? Aren't you not getting, the, you know, the positive experiences? Mm -hmm. I'm just going, well, apparently I'm not. And that itself is a bigger issue. Just that moment of self-realization, that, that moment of kind of self-reflection, that is the magic moment. That's the magic moment in a conversation where you're like, oh, I really have not thought about that. Not, I haven't thought about that and I'm going to change my ways. It's just, cool, that's another data point that I could add to who I am. And I now have a choice about how I progress. Yeah. What are those choices? What are those moments? And there's a way in which I think the industry 
the tech industry has some of that humility. I think that engineering, for example, this is what the agile movement is about, right, in engineering, is to say, look, you don't necessarily have the answer. You can't plan ahead for months because things may change. You may suddenly realize that something is radically different. One of your assumptions, one of your premises is radically different and you have to change things. But it's still doing that in a very technical way. And being able to do that in a way that is more human, this comes to something vital in our definition of this podcast, which is that we talk about technology a lot and about scaling technology, but ultimately I'm interested in what happens when you scale systems. And as we know, the difference there is that many systems are human systems, the corporation being the most applicable one here. And this is something that we've already talked about in one of the other conversations we've had, is how do you grow a company in an ethical way? There's the, the saying that, you know, capitalism, unfortunately, the philosophy is just growth for the sake of growth, which is the same ethos as the cancer cell, right? In the, Growth for the sake of growth is not an actual thoughtful philosophy. It is propelled by outside forces. It is trying to do some things that you don't necessarily actually believe in, unless you really are a megalomaniac. And so how do we deal with human systems scaling? Like in the ways that one of the main obvious downfalls of the big social networks is their inability to moderate, right? Their inability to apply a human view to all of the content that is flowing through them and treat all of it in a human way is a giant scale problem, right? Mm -hmm. And you have these people who are dealing with engineering saying, well, yeah. we can. Ha here's how we set up servers to deal with, you know, 10 million tweets a minute, how do we set up people to deal with 10 million tweets a minute is suddenly something that they don't want to think about. How do you protect the people who are dealing with that as well? That's the other I, thing I did as well. A, yeah. We did a big episode on that for Digital Human. It was wonderful. It was called Sin Eaters. And it was all about sort of imagining the people, the blessed moderators. Um, did you talk to any of them? Yeah, we got one. He was very forthcoming as well. But, you know, I mean, part of it, I mean, you're basically asking me to create a national political system. <laughs> New political theory with Alex Kratosky. Um, I don't know because, you know, <laughs> everything does everything does seem to operate within some kind of ideological framework. <laughs> <laughs> These ideological frameworks have like have existed for millennia or have, have emerged and evolved over a very, very long period of time. For that, you might wish to talk with a political theorist, actually. It might be really interesting to talk with somebody who has observed or like, you know, watched the Caucasus become their own entity or watched South Sudan and North Sudan become their own countries. You know, speak with somebody in Catalonia about how to ensure a, you know, a, a, a single identity you know, when you have so many different people that you're trying to please, <laughs> how do you create that identity? You know, there was a lot of people who were talking about that when the EU began, um, you know, when the single currency began. I remember fascinating discussions within my psychology department about how do individual countries still maintain their identities when underneath the auspices or underneath the umbrella of a, a larger nation. And as we've seen, that that has been more and less successful. So that might be an interesting person to answer that question. I don't feel qualified to say, this is the way you scale a company. I mean, I'd be like, oh, make sure everybody has a voice. <laughs> I don't know. I, I genuinely have no idea. But no, you've actually answered the question because the thing is, you know, what we're asking you is not so much what do you do, but how do you ask what you do? Yeah. Who do you talk to? What are the kinds of questions we should be asking? Who are the people we should yeah. be talking to? Yeah, I'd ask somebody who's been, not necessarily somebody who's been involved in, in growing a company. I'd be interested in, I mean, basically growing a country. <laughs> how do you do wow. that? How do you make sure that everybody is bought in and how do you make sure that even those people who aren't bought in don't feel like they're being ignored? Because if they're ignored, then you're going to end up dead, <laughs> literally dead. And like, how do you do that? How do you support people through that new age of identity? Yeah. But yeah, I personally would want to hear from them rather than somebody who's grown their company. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. I'd be more interested in finding out what, what they've done. But then again, remember, when I was thinking about, you know, how we can get more humanity into digital technology, I was interviewing sound designers and I was interviewing scent makers and I was interviewing people who do, I was interviewing, ah, oh, I was interviewing a taste computer which is a panel of people that exists. There are three different ones around the world. There's one in New Jersey, there's one at Reading in the UK, and then there's one in Singapore. And it's, you know, how do you manufacture a standardized tomato? Ooh. Wow. Right? How do you create that thing that tastes the same to everybody? And it's like, it's a fascinating panel. So that's what I was interested in. That's how I do these things. <laughs> I look at like other people from other environments and ask them, Ask them how Korea, they do that. what a tomato should taste like? 14 people around a table. But they don't because that's why they have three different ones. Because there's one in the U.S., there's one in the U.K. or was Europe. And then there is one in Singapore to try and capture what that means. You've completely yeah. blown my mind because I was already cool? fascinated by the concept of, you know, the standard metric kilogram living in Paris or wherever. Oh, yeah. Else. I know. But I there's the it. standard metric so tomato. Cool. Yeah. I, I swear this is why diversity is important. Everybody thinks well, that's yeah. the answer. And we all have totally very agree. different life experiences. Absolutely. If you ask me how to grow a company, I'm going to be like, don't talk to somebody who's grown a company. <laughs> talk to somebody who's grown a country. Yeah, that's what I would say. That's amazing. <laughs> You know, because I'm thinking about countries like Botswana and Estonia that have gone through total reinvention yeah. in a couple of decades. Yeah. And the president of Estonia is very forthcoming. He's really nice. He's super, super nice. I think he's from Philly. <laughs> Weirdly, really? he's yeah, and his like mother was Estonian or something, and and he like he went over and he's like, I'll take the job, and he like helped to reinvent and helped to get everybody online. Yeah, it was really cool. I did it for um, the Virtual Revolution TV series that I did. This has been astonishingly helpful in giving us things to think about for our podcast and and things that we want to ask people and investigate and people we want to talk to. Oh, I'm so glad. It was great to have you here today. <laughs> Anytime, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Unintended Consequences. To help us observe how the unexpected success of a project can adversely affect the environment around it, please give this podcast a five-star rating on iTunes and promote it to every single person you know. You can learn more about LaunchDarkly at launchdarkly.com slash podcast and follow us on Twitter at LaunchDarkly. LaunchDarkly.